Now, a couple of years ago, in a Radio 1 poll to find the funniest man in Britain, John Cleese was the winner. But my next guest picked up a few votes too, along with Michael Fish and Neil Kinnock. But he is a man who has held high office, and his undeniable skill as a political tactician has impressed even his enemies. He is the Right Honourable Norman Tebbit, MP. <laughs> Now, next Tuesday, the 11th of October, you'll be returning to the same Brighton Hotel where you were bombed exactly four years ago. And, and is your wife, Margaret, going with you? Yes, indeed. Yes. Did she need to be persuaded to do that? No, no, not at all. It's um, what we would expect to do. It, conference is there this year. We go to the conference. Last year, we went to Blackpool. Now, imagine that. <laughs> you know, I, so now we're ready for Brighton. How, how is your wife now? She's in pretty good shape, um, in good spirits, um, good enough to come out with me this evening. She said she wanted to see some fellow called... Um, hey. Hey. As Aspel? As Aspel. As Aspel. Aspel. Oh, Aspel, yes. Aspel. I'm totally sorry. I thought you were trying to say Iglesias. I understand. <laughs> Oh, we know about him. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I did notice, having uh, seen her this evening before, that, that there is an improvement, isn't there, on your wife's uh, movements? Yes, she, um, she has had some improvement. She, oh, I think it's about a year ago now, she found she could manage a champagne glass. <laughs> Fortunately, we've got her to teacups now, because it, it was getting slightly expensive. <laughs> she didn't mind how she felt <laughs> after that. Now, uh, forgive me for harking on about this, but it's still in everyone's mind, this experience that you went through. Do you actually remember everything that happened that night? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, it, it was not one of our best nights, you know, quite clearly. And I've, uh, I've spoken to the manager at the hotel about it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it was three or four hours waiting for the room service. That was the real problem. He promised it won't happen again. <laughs> what, yes, what were you thinking about during all those hours of waiting for rescue? Was your mind quite clear? To the best of my belief. Um, to be serious, one wonders under circumstances like that, what the hell is going on? You don't know whether the whole hotel was down. I didn't know whether... I was the surviving member of the cabinet, or, or what? Um, no idea at all. And in some ways, that's the, the worst of it. You know, you're just there in total darkness, um, wondering what the hell's happened, and how long it's going to be before anyone finds you. It's uh, very uncomfortable. And holding your wife's hand, obviously, was of a great help. That's right. And then eventually the very welcome, horny hand of Fred the fireman, who... I, I don't think I've ever held on to another man's hand quite so strongly as I held <laughs> on to his when it eventually got to me. Yes. You've escaped death more than once, of course. I mean, you were a pilot and you, you were in a very narrow mm -hmm. scrape. What happened? Oh, well, that was a not untypical flying accident um, when, for reasons which we've never quite sorted out, you know, the Air Force blamed me and I blamed the aeroplane and everybody blamed everybody, so to speak. Um, I failed to take off one morning um, uh, on an air exercise and uh, my number two just took off, you know, you're supposed to stay in formation with him and I spoke to him about it afterwards, said, what sort of chap are you deserting me at a moment like this? And um, I went on off the end of the runway and uh, the aeroplane came apart and it was all sort of rather uncomfortable for a while. But, um, yeah, it's one of those things, I guess, uh, we get used to facing death if we use the M1 or the M25 terribly often, don't we, all of us? <laughs> has it, has it, both these experiences and others, perhaps, ha had a lasting effect then on your attitude to life? Yes, to be serious, I think they have. Um, I think that I concluded from that first escapade that really I was fortunate to have survived and therefore every day is a bonus. Mm. And if you look on life like that, um, even the bad days are good days. 
um, you know, even if it's an awful day, well, it's, it's still a great day because it's a day that you might well not have had. And I think it gives you a good attitude towards life. Now, you've got a, an autobiography, and I'm going to read a bit of this, hence the bins here. <laughs> and you talk about flying, and you describe it almost as if it's a, a love scene. Now, John, uh, listen to this, unless you've read it already. Um, it's about flying, and, and it says, um, it was sheer animal thrill, the physical exertion of handling the last RAF fighter without powered controls, the numbing, bruising ride on a bumpy day, the sweat of excitement, and the heat of the atmospheric friction as the two jets smashed the aircraft through the resisting air, all combined with the spur of competition and the thrill of danger. Wow, that's passionate stuff there. Yeah. It was great it was fun at the time, too. <laughs> yeah. well, what's that kind of excitement about? You see, if you're a total physical coward like me, you can hardly believe that anybody does that voluntarily. Well, I don't know. I, I don't think it's any more difficult, actually, than stripping off in front of the camera. <laughs> Depends what you go in for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's as brave as I go. Yeah. And what you do, Norman, doesn't hurt other people as well. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, these escapades—I mean, zooming motorbikes and I think pranging the CO's car as yeah, well—and that, was, that uh, was that was not a good idea. I can tell no. you that. And reckless, uh, boozy parties. I mean, does this imply that you were, you were, or are reckless, even perhaps irresponsible? Well, now I'm a very sober, staid, middle-aged chap. Um, but uh, I think anybody that doesn't sometimes have just a little irresponsible outburst when they're young is never going to grow well, up. I was going to say, have you ever been reckless? But of course, we've seen the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> have you, though? Not all of it, actually. It was very discreet. <laughs> very discreet. No, I have never have. I've always been, you know, highly introverted. And uh, <laughs> the idea, as I say, of going mountaineering or riding a motorcycle very fast. I mean, it is quite clearly insane to me, and I'm going to leave it to other people in their diminishing numbers. I, I never rode my motorbike very fast. It wouldn't go very fast. <laughs> my mistake was the fact that I was the victim of a plot. You know how politicians are often <laughs> victims of plots. Yeah. It happened to me from a very young age. And uh, I was persuaded that I could ride my motorcycle upstairs. What I didn't know was that my friends, and I use this expression loosely, had loosened the clips on the stair carpet. <laughs> so that as I was about halfway up, I was conscious of having to use more and more throttle to stay where I was until the inevitable and awful moment when motorcycle and I and stair carpet all finished up at the bottom of the stairs. Three brushes with death. <laughs> Now, you've both been involved actively with uh, projecting politics and uh, politicians on, on television. Um, do you feel that humour is a very useful weapon in that? Yes, you have to be very careful about humour in politics, though, uh, because you can very easily be misunderstood. And, um, you know, sometimes people don't like politicians to make jokes, and uh, you, you have to do it very carefully. It's a shame I politicians don't use humour more. I mean, people are constantly telling me, Oh, he's funny. I mean, you have this reputation. You know, he's very funny, but he doesn't show it a great deal in public. And I, I'm very curious why you don't. Well, I think sometimes one's, one's afraid, because a lot of jokes, um, there's some element of which, which may offend somebody in some way. Now, you can get away with um, making mm. a joke about people who are old, or people who are young, or people who are bald, or people who are <laughs> lame, or something like that. Yes, yes that's right. <laughs> Um, but when a politician does, you know, you yes, get the sort true. of 94 indignant letters, very, very easily indeed. And if it's 94, you're lucky. You know. yeah. um, so one has to be very careful. But it's very persuasive, isn't it? I mean, if I can make a point mm. and make you smile or laugh at my point, you take the point. You've mm. agreed with me by smiling or laughing with me. You can get away with it in the House of Commons, yeah. where, of course, if you're in a corner, of some sort. The easiest way to defuse it, the easiest way to escape is mm. with a joke. And equally, if somebody um, gets a good joke at your expense in the House of Commons, the best thing to do is to really enjoy it. Stand there and laugh, you know, seething within, but you mm. laugh. <laughs> and you keep laughing for long enough to give you time to think about how you come back at it. Yeah. <laughs> some of the jokes are very high order, I, I must say. 